that growing up in the Midwestern United States, I can remember the weather being crazy. The running joke was the, the speed with which the weather would change. In a word, it was unpredictable. Typically, this is not a word we use to describe God. However, there is much of God that remains a mystery to us. In the words of the Apostle Paul, we know in part. 1 Corinthians 13 and 9. This missing knowledge of God can cause us to question our faith at times. In our journey to understand who God is and grasp His nature, we can become overwhelmed by the fact that he is far beyond us. To this end, his actions are not only divinely d dynamic, but truly unpredictable. In our lesson text, we see that God is not subject to demonstrate his power in a way that we think is best. He is sovereign, therefore, he works in the ways he wants, regardless of our opinions, and in some cases, regardless of our desires. Amen. So we understand sometimes, you know, we think that we know everything that needs to be done. And we got our mindset that, well, God, you know, if you'll do it like this, you know, it'll work. And God, if you'll take care of this over here, you know, we won't have no problems. Everything will fall and nobody will be out of the comfort zone. But that's not how God operates. Amen. He operates in a way that is beyond our capacity to understand. Amen. There are bits and pieces. Amen. The scripture tells us that, you know, we look through a glass darkly. So we're not able to see things the way that we want to see it. Amen. But by and by, as the song goes, we're going to understand it better. Amen. And so we have to allow God to do the things that he does. We've got to be willing, amen, to say, God, I don't know everything. But you know and you see the big picture. Amen. Amen. So that's what we have to have the understanding of to know that in God all things are possible and it's not for us to question how he does his business, right? All right, Syria surrounded Samaria. Sin and rebellion had once again led the people of God into a place of total loss. Surrounded in the midst of famine, King Jehoram, the son of Ahab, was desperate. The power of God is most effective when people get desperate enough to lay down their pride and submit to his plan. The problem is, is we are in a world that people like to do things their way. Amen. But we can never forget, this is not Burger King. Amen. We have to do things God's way. Amen. That's the reason he has given us his word. He has afforded us the opportunity that if we will study the word and show ourselves approved unto him. Amen. Hallelujah. Then we've got the power to rightly divide the word of truth through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, through the strength of God's anointing. We're able to stand. Amen. And move in the spirit that God would have us to move in. Praise God. It is always amazing how often people will allow pride to stop the move of God in their lives. Pride will bring division into any relationship. The first year, uh, few years of marriage will teach this principle well. All newlyweds will encounter a time in their marriage when they will need to humble themselves to reduce any conflict. Most fighting in any relationship is a result of either party not being willing to let, let go of pride and bring the discussion to a peaceful resolution. Pride has destroyed many relationships. Any relationship that allows pride to go unchecked will end in failure. If you find yourself in a dispute or argument, make sure to check your spirit and make sure your pride is not the reason for the ongoing conflict. And that's one of the things we think that it's only our way when it comes to a marriage. Amen. But a marriage is something of give and take. Praise God. We have to be willing to work together. Amen. We've got to come to a conclusion in it. In every, in every situation, if we're going to have peace. Amen. But if everything is only one-sided, it's never going to work. You can never, ever forget the, that the relationship between God and his church is a relationship of marriage and the bride. Amen. He is the bridegroom. 
The church is the bride, so therefore we have to be willing to do what is necessary, amen, when he asks us to do something. But the great thing about this relationship is, amen, when we've got problems, we're able to go to him and we're able to have a discussion. And if we're willing, amen, to understand that he knows the way that we take, amen, and he knows all things that we, as the people of God, we're not able to see all the way to the other side. Amen. But God is able to see everything. Amen. He knows the pitfalls that are before us. Amen. He knows the stumbling blocks that the devil has cast. Amen. He is able to see everything that we have need of. Amen. Where we are not. Every day we're taking it one step and one day at a time. And so we've got to be willing to talk to him and listen to what he has to say. Amen. All right. There was a severe famine in Samaria. All right, the scripture speaks of the economic conditions in Samaria reaching rock bottom. The people had turned to cannibalism to satisfy their hunger. Although the king Jehoram was angry with the prophet, this situation had been brought about by the king's own leadership and rebellion against the word of God. Amen. There's a lot of things. Now, I want you to understand Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to people that are walking with God. Amen. That are praying. That are seeking God. You know why? Because God established life. He allows us to get up every morning. Amen. And, and begin to go through life. And, and the thing about it is, is the people of God. Amen. They don't know what the people that are not of God are doing. That's the reason, amen, people get out on the street and, and, and they're doing all manner of things. You're driving down the road and you're obeying all the laws and you're doing it. And somebody else can cross the center line. Somebody else can run the red light. Somebody else can do something that they're not supposed to do, amen. And it causes the people of God to suffer, amen, because somebody else is not doing what they're supposed to be. That's life. This is not about, you know, God, what did I do? You know, did I have sin in my life? Why did this come about? No, that's life because bad things happen. But we also understand that we, we walk and we live, amen, under the hand of a sovereign king who is able to watch out for us. There's no doubt in my mind that there's been times that the Lord protected me, amen, when the enemy was trying to destroy me. And you can say the same thing. Praise God. So while we're in this life, what does the scripture say? You shall have troubles. You shall have, you should have persecution. Amen. We're going to have tribulation in this life. He told, he's not hiding anything from us. Amen. We're going to have struggles and problems in this life. Amen. Because it's life. Right? Amen. So reading on, it says, you know, uh, uh, the people in Samaria, they were beginning to turn. They, they were eating their own babies. They were starving to death. Destruction was coming upon them with no doubt. Amen. And, and uh, it just keeps coming back to my mind, a message that I preached uh, last year around uh, February or March. You know, we can't just sit here. Something's got to change. Amen. If you sit there and you do, and I've, I've told this over, if you sit there and you do the same thing that you've always done, you're going to continually get what you've always got. Amen. I want to tell a story, but I won't. But I want to. Amen. All right, so what is beautiful to consider is the tremendous miracle God performed in the Great Depression of Samaria. This story should remind its leaders that God's omnipotence is not limited to spiritual troubles, but includes economic and financial matters as well. All right, Elisha prophesied. In this setting, the king of Israel turned to the prophet Elisha for direction. Some believed the word of the Lord that, that came from the prophet. Others did not. Amen. Do we have to deal with things like that? Sometimes the word of the Lord speaks to us, and, and we want to believe what the man of God is saying. Amen. And then there's going to be a group that, oh, I don't believe that. I don't think they're required to do that. I don't think we have to go down that avenue. I don't think we have to dress like that. I don't think. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. What does the Word of God say? That is what we will be judged to. Amen. According to the written Word of God is what we will be judged to according to God's law. 
Amen. I told I told Barberville the other night, and I was talking about you know when uh, uh, when we're driving down the road. Amen. And and you know, and people they're reading the Bible, and they say, "Well, you know, I just don't have a conviction about that. I don't you know I don't have a you know uh, any kind of, of a problem." With uh, uh, with uh, you know, the thing the Bible says, no, I'm not supposed to do that, but I'm not convicted. So therefore, it's not, hey, that's not what the Bible says. Amen. If God wrote it down or had it written down in the Word of God, amen, it is not something that we can question. It's something that we obey. So when when you run through that red light or you run through that stop sign, Amen. And you go plowing through there and then the blue lights start flashing and they pull over and, and the officer walks up and says, uh, yes, you know, can I see your license and registration and your insurance card? And you reach over and get it and, and he looks at it and then he says, well, do you know why I pulled you over? No, Lord, I'm, or not Lord, no officer. I'm really not sure about this. He said, well, you know, you just went through that red light. You just went, went through that stop sign. And then you look over and say, well, I don't feel convicted about that. I don't have no problem with it. There wasn't no cars coming. You know, what was the need of me stopping and waiting for a car to come? Hey Amen. you were sitting under that red light. So why do I have to wait on there wasn't anybody coming? I never broke no law. I'm not convicted about that. And the officer said, oh, pardon me. I'm so sorry for my mistake. You go on about your way. Not. That's not how God operates. That's not how the law operates. He wrote it down for us to submit to. Praise God. And the laws of our state and our government, they're there for our protection. Doesn't matter if you've got a conviction about it or not. Amen. It's a matter of obedience to the word of God to the laws of our land. So Elisha prophesied, and there were some people, they, they agreed with it. And then there was always some, amen, that's not going to agree with it. And we deal with that on a regular basis. Those who believe the gospel will be partakers. But those who refuse to believe may see but, uh, may, uh, may see but not be able to practice or partake. Here we also have the same imagery as Moses and his final days. Because of Moses' unbelief, it was not allowed to enter the promised land. Numbers 20 and verse 12. A mistrust in God will always cause a person to miss out on the glorious things he planned. Now God shouldn't have kept Moses out of the promised land. He dealt with all them rebellious people for 40 plus years. He, you know, he was God's man and, and, you know, and he worked and he heard the people griping at him and fussing at him and, and, and screaming at him and threatening to kill him and, and all this stuff. God should not have kept Moses out. Well, who made you law? Who made us, amen, the ones to dispute what God's planning is? Amen. The fact of the matter is, oh, God wouldn't keep me out of heaven for that little white lie. God wouldn't keep me out of heaven just for that little bitty thing. You know, it, it, it's so significant, it's only one verse. God wouldn't do that to me. Well, he kept Moses out. If God would not even allow Moses to go in because of his disobedience, because of his rebellion, any way you want to look at it, God told him, said, strike the rock the first time. The second time he told him, he said, speak to the rock. Moses hit it again. Hey, you don't strike the Lord the second time. Amen. Moses disputed with God, amen, thinking that he was going to do it his way. Well, it worked this way the first time, so I'm going to do it again. So he made himself God. He made himself law. He made himself the order of the land and it cost Moses from going into the promised land. Who are we to think that we don't have to obey the laws of God just because we don't think it's significant? I am teaching about unexpected ways. God's will 
or word will come to pass. If Jesus said it, I believe it. His word cannot lie. If it's written in the Bible, I believe it till I die. Though the world should pass away. No, I'm just going. God can't are not words we like to use. I, I made this statement years ago. I heard, I heard a wonderful old missionary tell us, said, you know, so many times, we use the two words. Can God? Can God do this? Can God do that? Can God deliver? Can God make a way? Can God lift me up? Can God heal my body? Can God turn it around? Can God? Hey, just move your can. God can do this. God can do that. God can heal. God can make a way. God can lift up. God can change the situation. It's all about where you put your can that makes a difference. Amen. Hallelujah. And too many people, they want to question and they want to start it out. God can't do that. But God can do all things except lie. God can do all things, amen, except be false. Amen. So nonetheless, there are some things God cannot do. The scripture tells us God cannot lie. He is bound to his word. The story of the lepers illustrate once again that the word of the Lord will always come to pass. The prophet wrote, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, and it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper. Amen. In the thing whereunto I sent it. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11. We can rest assured that God's will will always come to pass. Amen. Uh, Brother Harris told me years ago and he told, uh, uh, told his son-in-law. Because his son-in-law was trying out for a church. Amen. And Brother Harris told him, he said, you know, amen. Sometimes God's will is not the people's will. It's God's will for us to do this. It's God's will for us to do that. But sometimes we're warring against flesh. Amen. That are not in obedience to God's will. They're not submitted to God's plan. They're not following through with what, with what God had called them to do. Therefore, God allows us to take the choice that we want to take. But for those that love the Lord, those who pray, those who seek God, those who are interested in the ways of God, amen, God's will will always be performed in their lives. Amen. And He will use some of the most unconventional ways, according to us, to bring His will to pass. Can you say amen? Four lepers at the gate of the city. Banished to the outskirts of the city, the four lepers are the ones God chose to bring salvation to the Samaritans. These unlikely and unqualified outsiders changed the course of a nation and gave another chance to a king to get it right. It seems as if it is often the people no one would expect whom God chooses to use in his plan. Amen. I'm telling you right now, Never ever dreamed the first time that I bowed the knee to the Lord and he touched my life, amen. I had hair uh, down to my shoulders, I was greasy, I was nasty, amen. And God picked me up out of my despair, amen. He picked me up out of my situation, he turned my life around, amen. He set me up on a straight street, amen. I never ever dreamed that I would ever preach the word. I never ever dreamed that I would ever cry out to God. I never ever dreamed that those things would take place. But God used as people that you never thought he would use. God will use me and if he will use me, he will use you because he is no respecter of person. Amen. He's looking for somebody to say, use me. Use me, Lord. Bring me. Hallelujah. Let me do what you would have me to do, O oh God. For those people, amen, the people you never ever thought about are the very ones that he will use. The Richmond Church they're going to have somebody come and preach for them next week. Now, you all are not to repeat this. It's on, it's been on, so he might be watching it. This young man, he was about this tall. 
we come, we come into camp. About this tall. We were walking in towards the tabernacle and he come up to us or came up to me. And he said, sir, he said, can you give me 50 cents? Pop machines at camp were 50 cents. Can you give me 50 cents to buy a pop? There you go. Thank you. And me and my family, we start on over to the tabernacle. I seen him run over to all of his buddies over in the, in the pavilion. He had a whole pocket full of change. It had burnt me up. Just never could get over it. The little snot. So last year he came before the board to be licensed. And before he came in there, there he was, Jason Perry. I said, Jason Perry... Brother Knox's stepson? Yeah. I said, that little snot. And I told the district board what he'd done. Yeah, he was that tall. You know, that's, some people look at that. You know, he, he, had, he was an entrepreneur. And so Jason comes in with his wife, and they sit down, and Brother Marshall said, Brother Thomas, I'd like for you to tell Brother Perry your little story you told us before we came in. So he's all wide-eyed, stepping before the board. He's wide-eyed, and, and I said, well, Brother Perry, I said, when you was about this tall, I said, we were camping, I began to tell. And he said, Brother Thomas, he said, I might have done it. <laughs> but when we ask him to tell us his burden, he just began to break down and cry. The anointing of God came up over that young. And just like that, just that quickly, all I could see was the presence of God upon this young man. You see, God will use some of the most unlikely people you've ever spoke of. He will use you. He will use me. The ones he's interested in who is willing to humble themselves before God. That's the one he's going to use. That's the one he's going to touch. That's the one he's going to lift up. That's the one, amen, he will make away with. Amen. Who would have ever thought that God would have used four leprous men that were unclean they weren't even allowed to come in and be around anybody else, but God used them to bring a miracle about. That's the God that we serve. Amen? Praise God. It seems as if it is often the people no one would expect whom God chooses to use for His plan, or in His plan. For Abraham to Jacob, from Gideon to David, God has consistently empowered those who did not match the standard of what some would call great. This is even seen in the 12 men Jesus chose to be his inner circle. Jesus called the disciples to have significant insight and receive unrestricted access to his ministry. Yet the religious leaders were astounded. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. It was not merely the disciples' education level the leaders were uh, referring to, but rather the fact these were common people, fishermen and tax collectors, and yet they were well-versed in the Hebrew text and the plan of the Messiah. Praise God. These were not men that anybody was suspected. Amen. But if somebody was out and about and they began to mention, Amen, your name, can, can they say to you, Hey, 
They've been with Jesus. Hey, they they walk with God. Hey, they've had an experience with the Master. Hey, hallelujah. You can't touch their lives. They may not be the typical person of what we thought that they ought to be. Amen. But they have been with Jesus. It's going to take no. Amen. When somebody sees you, when somebody sees us, when somebody sees man, when somebody sees this church, amen, will anybody say they have been with Jesus? Jesus. That's what it's about. Amen. Because God's going to use whoever makes themselves available. All right. Why stay here until we die? The divine force of these lepers were summed up in the question, or the driving force of these lepers were summed up in the question they considered. Why stay here until we die? In other words, how can this get any worse? Their situation had gotten to the point where they no longer feared the consequences of death. The fear of death would no longer hold them back. Often people will allow fear to hold them hostage. Whether it is something simple like a job or a career move, fear tends to keep people in the state they are in rather than trying to reach for something greater. We focus on our mind and we say, I better stay here, I, I can't take a chance. I better stay here. Hey, man, I've got so much to lose. Brother, I said this a while back. Hey, man, Brother uh, uh, Jeff Arnold had talked about, said reading that book that his wife had got him for Christmas. And in that book, Wayne Gretzky, is that right? He said that he noticed... 100% of the shots that he was afraid to take, he missed. If you're not willing to take the risk, you're never going to move forward. How do you know God ain't going to heal that individual when you lay your hand on them? How do you know God isn't going to deliver them when you pray before them? How do you know God isn't going to use you, amen, to bring about salvation for a whole household? How do you know unless you take the shot? Amen. Pray about it and seek the Lord. Amen. But the one thing about it is if you don't do nothing, you're not going to get anything. we got to be willing to say, hey, It could very well be that God's going to use me to bring about this deliverance. It could very well be that God is going to use me, amen, to witness to them. It could be, amen, that God is going to touch my family because I ask. That's what makes the difference. Fear is something all humans share. In many ways, fear is a major factor in every life choice a person makes. Fear can be a good thing. A healthy fear will let us know when something is wrong. It will ensure that our children and loved ones are cared for and safe. However, fear can also become unhealthy and irrational. The spirit of fear can gain strength when unchecked in our lives. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. As believers, we must make up our minds that fear will not hinder the progress of the gospel. Nor will it keep us from everything God has in store for our lives. You don't know. The Bible says, you know, that you know, we have to try things. Amen. The Bible says, try the spirits. See if they be of God. Amen. Draw yourself back and begin to pray. It could very well be that God will give you the direction, or there again, it could very well be that God will keep you out of a situation. Is that right? Amen. All right. They decided to walk to the Syrians. Each day, we will make hundreds, if not thousands, of decisions. The recipe for success is making good decisions. One study showed that the cascade of choices a person evaluates each day actually leads to what psychologists refer to as decision fatigue. One thing rings true and is important to understand. Not all decisions are created equal. For instance... Choosing your spouse and choosing your toothpaste are obviously not equivalent to uh, for uh, the the proposition. Is that right? Amen. Amen. 
Should I marry her or buy Colgate? You know, and she's got beautiful hair, but this is 3D whitening. You know, it, it's, a, it's a matter of how you look at things, isn't that right? For instance, I've done said that, so let me, let me get on down. The four lepers were faced with the decision that would determine the fate of their lives and the destiny of a nation. Understanding the gravity of our decisions is paramount in our walk with God. There may be some choices we will make today that will set us on a path of growth or lead us down a path of destruction. All right, God drove the Syrians away. Those four lepers, they began to make their way down to the Syrian camp. All the Syrians heard were the sounds of an army coming. They heard the sounds of chariots. They heard the sounds of horses running. Amen. They heard the sounds of arms to the place that they were so fearful, they didn't try to save anything. They just ran for their lives. There's no telling what God will use when we get up and begin to make our way towards God's will. Amen. God orchestrates all manner of things in our lives if we make ourselves available to Him. Isn't that right? Praise God. God will always fight for His people. This story shows that God is more than just in our, uh, in our corner. In fact, there are uh, moments in life when we are too weak to, or too overwhelmed and exceedingly overmatched. But it is in those situations when God steps in and fights the battle for us. Over and over, stories in Scripture describe the way God defends His people. Standing on the edge of the land promises to their fathers. The children of Israel saw an enemy of great power occupying their destiny. In the midst of their fear, two people reported the victory within, uh, was within reach. The word of the Lord came to the people affirming the faith of Joshua and Caleb. The word was a consistent message to the people of Israel. The Lord said, The Lord your God, He shall fight for you. Deuteronomy 3 and 22. The message of assurance was re repeated multiple times throughout the journey of Israel to the promised land. We should never forget the battle always belongs to God. I don't care if there's just one of you. If it's me and God, if it's you and God, that is a majority. Amen, because God, if he can speak and did speak this world into existence, amen, if he spoke, amen, and light and darkness was separated, amen, and when he spoke, amen, the waters was separated, amen, when he spoke, the grass and the herbs and all these things come to pass, when he spoke, the creeping things came upon the earth, we serve a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. Amen. Anytime you're looking towards the Lord and you're getting the direction of God, God will never lead you astray. That's the enemy's business. Amen. God's business is victory. Amen. And when it's me and God, amen, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Amen. God is with us because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Principalities, powers, amen. It doesn't matter if it's, a, if it's evil men or wicked men in high places. It does not matter. Amen. When we're trusting the Lord, God can use some of the most unusual circumstances you've ever, you know, you've ever even uh, allowed yourself to see. God can use you. Hallelujah. God can use me. God can use us. God can bring about victory. Hallelujah. In the most dire circumstances. Amen. Don't cast it astray. Amen. If God said it, I believe it. Amen. Let's clap our hands to Jesus right now. Hallelujah. He's just looking for somebody that will volunteer. Amen. He's not going to make you do anything. He won't do it. He'll let you choose. And that's what it's all about. All right, God responds to hunger. 
The hungry always seem to get God's attention. Jesus, standing in the midst of more than 5,000 people, said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Both spiritually and physically, it would seem God cannot resist those who hunger and thirst. This fact is deeply rooted in his character. We see his uh, compassion for humanity scattered throughout the Bible. God himself told Moses that his compassion is given by himself alone. God said, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You see, sometimes we put it in our mind, well, God's word says thus and so. God never ever contradicts his word. Amen. But in our, in our ways of thinking and in our flesh and our carnality, we want to bind the hands of God. But God said, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. It is not our position to dictate whether somebody has got it or somebody doesn't have it. Amen. If God chooses to have mercy upon them, then let's say, hey, hey, let God's will be done. Seems like nobody else was willing to do it. When the woman come to the king and said, well, you know, me and this woman, we were having to share, share an apartment. We were having to, you know, uh, kind of split the rent. We were living together. We didn't have no food. We didn't have anything. So she told me, said, well, if you'll give me your baby, we'll boil him and eat him today. Tomorrow we'll eat my son. Wonder why she picked the other woman's son first. When she come out and said, Oh, king, listen, you know, I've been wronged here. And the king said, Well, what do you want me to do? And he said, Well, this is what happened. And the Bible says the king rent his clothes, he put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. So upset. Then he sent and said, you go tell the man of God, I'm going, to, I'm going to take his head off. Blame the preacher. Why didn't the king go to the Syrian camp? Why didn't anybody else go? The man who, who's armed the king leaned, why didn't he go down to the Syrian camp? They wasn't doing anything to change their situation. But these four lepers, men that were outcast, these four leper men that were uh, that were dying of their disease, these four lepers, men, Amen, Hallelujah! Nobody would have ever dreamed that God would have orchestrated and used them. He will use anybody. They didn't realize it because many times God uses us, and we don't even realize how He is orchestrating His will in our lives. It's just a matter of listening to that voice and getting up and moving forward. Isn't that right? Praise God. They said the driving force of these lepers was summed up in the question they considered. Why stay we here? So God drove the Syrians away. It says, standing on the edge of the land promised by their fathers, they're looking and they're thinking, whoa, why sit here? Until we die. If we go in there, we're going to die. If we sit here, we're going to die. At least, if we go down to the Syrian camp, you know, if they save us, then we'll live. In this story, we see a small example of what happens when people are in need. God responds to the hungry. Of course, hunger is not the only requirement to get a response from God. God is faithful to his people. David said, I have been young. Now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalms 37, verse 25. God's people can trust him to care for the physical needs and to know that he responds to our faith for greater or greater needs as well. He's going to respond, amen, when we cry out unto him. Amen. We're almost done. We'll flip over to internalizing the message. In December, each year, we gather together to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. This one event has captured the attention of every believer, and it still stands 
as a sign of those who have yet to believe. It is often curious to consider the thoughts of those who were there to witness the birth of Christ. What did they think? Did they have a clue about what it meant to be the Messiah? Even with a little knowledge, even with a little knowledge, it seemed clear that no one can know for sure what God, what plans God has for His people. The Apostle Paul said, "Now we see through a glass darkly." First Corinthians thirteen and twelve, meaning there are many things about which we simply do not have a clear picture. The imagery here is looking at a foggy window and trying to determine what is being reflected. In our lives, we must find the room to trust God with every decision. Like the lepers, we cannot know for certain where or when God will choose to bless, deliver, heal, or save. Our job is not to figure out the method, but rather trust that God knows and will be faithful. Can you say amen? Let's clap our hands to the Lord as we stand. Thank you, Jesus. Appreciate the Lord so very, very much. Amen. We're going to go into, into this time of break for the next few minutes. Amen. So if you will, let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we're...